why I hate religion but love Jesus. As many of you know, that's the title of a spoken word poem that went viral as a YouTube video last month in mid-January 2012. Last I noted, there were more than 17 million viewers that checked out Jefferson Bethke's four-minute piece. It's thoughtful, it's passionate, it's compelling, and yes, it's even controversial. 22-year-old Jeff Bethke has created quite a stir and has stimulated a lot of good conversation. This video raises the important question of what it means to be an authentic Christ follower, a sincere disciple of Jesus. And as you may remember, that's my theme for this year's chapel messages, the shared life, Jesus' teaching on discipleship. And to introduce today's talk on that theme, I'd like to share an overview of the spiritual journey of John Wesley. If you are a Methodist, you know that John Wesley is considered to be the founder of your denomination going back to the 18th century. John Wesley's life story helps us to sort out the difference between religion and Jesus. John Wesley's life story helps us to define what it means to be an apprentice of Jesus. This morning, I'd like to tell John Wesley's story as told by Steve Brown, a pastor from South Florida, a professor of homiletics at Reformed Seminary in Orlando. Just recently, when I mentioned the name Steve Brown, someone asked, who's Steve Brown? And I said, well, he's an older Tullian Chavidjan. He's a guy who talks a lot about the gospel, a guy who talks a lot about grace. But there's something else that distinguishes the ministry of Steve Brown, and that is that he's an ordained minister who was ordained into the ministry before he became a Christian. That is, by his own assessment. He was a clergyman before he was a convert to an authentic faith in Jesus. And that's somewhat the same story of John Wesley, and that's why Steve Brown likes to talk so much about Wesley. And here's how he tells the story. A number of places, I'll be paraphrasing Steve Brown, I don't think that he'll mind. Here's how he tells the story. John Wesley was a student at Oxford University in the early part of the 18th century, and he was part of a group called the Holy Club. Wesley wrote in his diary, today I prayed two hours, tomorrow I will increase that to three hours. During those early years of his life, Wesley visited hospitals to minister to the sick. He visited prisons to minister to those who were bound. But inside, with all of his outward holiness, inwardly, Wesley was empty and frightened and lonely and thought of his life as meaningless. Steve Brown then comments, ladies and gentlemen, I have been there and that is why John Wesley is such a good friend of mine. I have also been called holy. I have been called reverend. I too have visited the hospitals and prisons, hoping that if I worked hard enough, hoping that if I prayed long enough, if I was holy enough, a God, if there is a God, would notice me and condescend to allow me to know him. These are Steve Brown's words in his testimony. And Steve Brown concludes, it was with great anticipation that John Wesley knelt before the bishop and was ordained into the Anglican priesthood. It was with great hope that this ordination into the priesthood would enable him to be noticed by the God of the universe. But as the bishop placed his hands on John Wesley's head, there was nothing there but emptiness, loneliness, and regret. Steve Brown comments, John Wesley served as a priest, and I've been there too. You minister to the sick, you bury the dead, you marry young couples, and people say, Reverend, you are so spiritual, but if you're faking it, it hurts, and Wesley was in that place. Steve Brown says, when you are a pastor or priest and are faking it, you have no idea of how deep the guilt is. There's only one step from there, it's to go to the mission field. So John Wesley said, 
I don't have it, but if I go on the mission field, maybe then God will notice how hard I'm working, how much it hurts, how empty I am, and maybe God will notice and condescend and reveal himself to me. So Wesley met a man by the name of General Oglethorpe, and he signed on as a missionary from England to the islands off the coast of Georgia. He decided he would be faithful and serve Christ on the mission field. The words written in John Wesley's diary on the day he left for Georgia were these. I'm going to Georgia to serve, I'm going to Georgia to save the heathen, but oh God, who will save me? John Wesley landed on those islands, performed his duties quite well, but went home a total failure. He tried, broken, he tried. He had been a priest, pastor, and missionary. He tried to serve God. He worked, he prayed, he administered, but no matter what he could do, God would not notice. And then, after returning to England, he opened his Bible in a candlelit room to the 130th Psalm. In the midst of his failure, he read these words. Out of the depths, out of the depths, I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. On May 24th, 1738, Wesley made his way to a meeting of Christians on Aldersgate Street. And there he heard Martin Luther's preface to the Book of Romans being read. And for the first time, his mind came alive to the reality of the gospel. He heard that it didn't have to do with what you do, it had to do with the blood of Christ, that salvation was to be found in Jesus Christ through faith in him alone. John Wesley wrote in his diary that night, my heart was strangely warmed. It was only a spark, but the spark became a flame and a consuming fire sweeping the entire world with the message of the gospel through the Methodists. Someone once asked Wesley why so many people came to hear him preach. He said, I set myself on fire and people came to see me burn. I love the way that Steve Brown tells that story because I know that it's the testimony of not only John Wesley and Steve Brown, but many others who have struggled to understand what it means to be a child of God and a follower of Jesus. As we work on that project ourselves, I invite you to join me in looking at Jesus' own words in the Gospel of John chapter 15. If you have a Bible, you may want to follow along in John 15. And before I read the text, let me remind you of the context of this passage. We're here in the upper room where Jesus observes the Passover meal with his 12 disciples. Jesus gets, gets up from the table and washes his disciples' feet. And during the meal, Judas leaves. Judas, the pretender, leaves. From the middle of chapter 13, Jesus has been delivering to his disciples what is called the upper room discourse, or what we might call Jesus' final lecture to his closest associates. At the end of chapter 14, Jesus suggests, come now, let us leave. Strangely enough, we don't know if they actually left the upper room at that point. Jesus continues to teach in chapters 15 and 16 and to pray in chapter 17. Our text for today is John 15, verses 1 to 8, the words of Jesus. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. 
If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus begins this section of teaching with the statement, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. If indeed Jesus and the eleven had left the upper room and were heading to the Garden of Gethsemane, they may have walked by or even entered into the temple. In the temple, over the door to the holy place, was a huge golden vine symbolizing Israel, the people of God. That image may have prompted Jesus to boldly say, I am the true vine. An interesting commentary on Israel's failures to produce good fruit. Or it may have been that Jesus and his disciples were further along in their journey toward Gethsemane, and they were out in the vineyards when Jesus uses a visual as a basis for his teaching. Our Lord may have had a grapevine in hand when he said, I am the vine, and you were the branches. Or maybe Jesus was inspired to use the metaphor of the vine and the branches with thoughts returning to the meal that they had just experienced together, drinking of the fruit of the vine at the institution of the Lord's Supper. In any case, Jesus teaching on discipleship with the symbolism of the vine and the branches is a profound revelation. Just as God made himself known to the world through the vine of Israel, it is now Jesus who occupies that prominent place. In the Old Covenant, the people of God were known by their attachment to Israel, where in the New Covenant, the people of God are known by their attachment to Jesus. Jesus' teaching on discipleship is illustrated graphically with language of Middle Eastern agriculture. And as we examine these things, I need to confess my personal limitations regarding agriculture and horticulture. Yes, my undergraduate major was biology, and biology majors were, at least when I was a biology major, required to take at least one course in botany. And I do remember taking a course in botany. It's on my transcript somewhere. I remember having to memorize long Latin words. And I recall that there are significant differences between every genus and species of every plant that God ever made. At one time, I could actually distinguish those things. Now I feel fortunate to be able to discern the difference between a rose and a tulip. But even I can appreciate the horticultural imagery that Jesus uses here in teaching important spiritual lessons. Look with me at our text in John 15, and specifically verses four and five. And as I read the text this time, I'll translate the Greek word meno using the older English term abide instead of the more common contemporary translation remain. Verse four, abide in me as I also abide in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must abide in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. Verse five, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I can't think of a more important word to describe Christian discipleship than this word, abide. Abiding in Jesus. We abide in Jesus and Jesus abides in us. I'm convinced that we do not give enough attention to this teaching of our Savior. We've all heard this before, but what does it mean to abide in Jesus? It's basic, but it's profound. It's simple, but it's life-changing. It's the essential description of what it means to be a follower of Christ, a disciple of our Lord, an apprentice of Jesus in this day in which we live today. 
Maybe it's the word abide that helps us to best understand the before and after versions of John Wesley. Before embracing the notion of abiding, we tend to look at Christian discipleship as performance. We consider this matter of Christ following as all about trying harder, trying harder to be more loving, trying harder to be more joyful, trying harder to be more peaceful, trying harder to be more patient. In our pre-abiding days, Christian living is all about our trying, 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 doing, doing, doing. But you might say that abiding in Jesus is more about a relationship than a ritual. Here in this last important lecture that Jesus is giving to his disciples, he's outlining the new life of the disciple that is going to happen after the cross and the resurrection. Jesus is about to leave his friends. That intimate fellowship where he walked and talked with those 12, that intimate fellowship over the course of three solid years is about to end, but Jesus is explaining to his apprentices that their relationship is not going to end, it is simply going to change. It's going to change from a physical relationship to a spiritual relationship, and he's already told them about this in chapter 14, verse 16, that I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. And so now a chapter later in chapter 15, Jesus is unpacking that new reality with the principle of abiding in the image of the vine and the branches. This notion of Christ in us, Jesus spiritually indwelling us in the person of the Holy Spirit is beautifully presented in the image of the vine and the branches. The branches draw their nourishment from their connectedness with the vine. And so the disciple of Jesus is one who has that ongoing, life-giving, nourishing connection to God, the Holy Spirit. You might say that the teaching of Jesus in this text is, does not help us to understand how one initially becomes attached to the vine, but here our Lord is helping us with our discipleship. Here we are learning how to maintain that attachment to Jesus, that we might see the production of fruit. I like the way that Dr. Gary Burge describes this text in his commentary on the Gospel of John. Dr. Burge writes, this means that Christianity is not simply about believing the right things, though this is important, nor is it simply a matter of living a Christ-like life, though this is important too. Christian experience must necessarily have a mystical, spiritual, non-quantifiable dimension. To be a disciple means having the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit living in us. It means having a supernatural interior experience that is completely unlike anything available in the world. It is a way of believing doctrine and a way of living ethics, but these are nurtured by a life-giving connection with Jesus Christ. Maybe we could put it this way, it is impossible for us to carry out even the best of intentions and the simplest of good works for any spiritual benefit unless we are abiding in Christ and Christ is abiding in us. Do you see why John Wesley's early years were so excruciatingly frustrating and painfully empty? As Jesus says in John 15, 4, abide in me as I also abide in you no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must abide in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. Some have called this 15th chapter of John's gospel, this teaching of Jesus here, the vine and the grapes. Because the teaching of Jesus is not really so much about the branches at all. Fruit is what Jesus is talking about, and the fruit is produced by the vine. So it's much more about Jesus than it is about us. I think that it's also instructive here that Jesus never really defines what he means by fruit. Because of that, interpreters have been all over the place in speculating on the meaning of fruit in this passage. 
Some insist that the fruit refers to converts. Others feel certain that the fruit is the fruit of the Spirit. I don't think we can be dogmatic about this, but I'm inclined toward a simpler view. In verse 8, Jesus says, This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. We show ourselves to be disciples of Jesus by living like Jesus, not in our own strength, but in his. As one writer says, we show ourselves to be disciples of Jesus with lives that attract people to Christ and thus make them new members of God's vine. We show ourselves to be disciples of Jesus by exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit, those qualities listed in Galatians 5, beginning with love, joy, peace, and patience. Dallas Willard says that the fruit of the Spirit simply is the inner character of Jesus himself that is brought about in us through the process of Christian spiritual formation. It is Christ formed in us. Dallas Willard continues to say, it is called fruit because like the fruit of trees or vines, it is an outgrowth of what we have become, not the result of a special effort to bear fruit. And we have become fruitful in this way because we have received the presence of Christ's spirit. In my last message on this theme, this series of Jesus teaching on discipleship, I spoke on the theme of the mark of the apprentice. And our text was John 13, verses 34 and 35, where Jesus said to his disciples, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. It is the teaching of Jesus in John chapter 13 that our love for our fellow believers in the body of Christ is proof to a watching world that we are indeed apprentices of Jesus. Interestingly enough, it is the teaching of Jesus two chapters later here in our text of John chapter 15 that there's another mark of the Christian, another identifying mark of those who are truly apprentices of Jesus, and that mark is fruitfulness. Jesus explains in John 15, verse 8, This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. It was a decade ago now that theologian J.I. Packer spoke in the theology conference here at Wheaton. And when he spoke in chapel that year, in April of 2002, he preached a message on our text, John 15. And the title of his chapel talk was, Going to the Dogs. Now, Dr. Packer is something of a dog lover and something of a comedian. At the time, he had four different dogs, a Newfoundland, a Bernice Mountain Dog, a Sheltie, and a Corgi Puppy. And Dr. Packer said that when all four dogs were in the same room together, you had to open a window. And, of course, we understand why. I'm glad that Dr. Packer is such a dog lover because his illustration from the world of dogs helps me to understand better the meaning of abiding in Christ. Packer said that all of his dogs were in the process of being trained. And one of the key things that a dog is trained to do is to stay, to stay put. It takes time and repetition to teach a dog to stay. There are certain hand movements and voice commands associated with this training, and a dog that is trained to stay will indeed stay when the trainer walks away. No matter what the distraction, no matter what anyone else is saying or doing, when the trainer says stay, the dog that is trained stays. And Dr. Packer explained that when he was working on the translation committee for the English Standard Version, the ESV, he was tempted to suggest that the phrase abide in me should be rendered stay put in me. He chose against that translation since most readers would not have an adequate background in dog training for this to make sense. But as Dr. Packer explains, stay put in me is what the text means. And that idea of staying put in Christ is not as simple or as easily managed 
as one might think. And Packer says this, it's hard work to stay put in Christ. There are all sorts of distractions. There is every kind of opposition from an anti-God world, our own sin nature, and the chief enemy himself, Satan and his demons. Well, I don't know if stay put in Christ helps you. It helps me. It's a clear encouragement to find our help and our hope in Jesus and to remain there, to abide there, and to find in that position the opportunity of seeing the growth of fruit, fruit that is produced by the vine of Jesus himself. Just before we close in prayer, I want to briefly look at one more verse from our text in John 15, a verse about prayer. Jesus said in verse seven, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Now, taken out of its context, this verse is troubling and confusing. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. What's that all about? But in its context, this teaching of Jesus makes all the sense in the world. Here is a call to a life of abiding and a life of prayer. Here is our Lord's encouragement to be so close to him in spirit and in truth that we will only want what God would want for us to have. We would only pray for what God would want us to pray for. We would certainly see the answers to our prayers as God intends best for us. So let's stand together and close in prayer and affirm our desire to be part of that abiding relationship with the Lord Jesus. Let's pray together. Great God and loving Lord, how great you are, how loving you are, how wise you are. Continue to reveal yourself to us through your word and by your spirit. Fill us with your spirit and produce in us fruit that only you can produce for our good and to your glory. Amen.